felt we could extend it with several optimizations. And finally, we wanted to implement decision trees on top of Spark, which is designed for iterative machine learning. However, there was no tree support in the initial versions of MLLib, and this is the mo motivation for our work. So in order to do a distributed implementation, we had to make one approximation. As you've seen in the toy example, we chose every feature value as a, as a part of a split candidate for continuous features. However, it's co costly to find these in a distributed setting. Moreover, you would, you, we normally want these values to be sorted in order to help with computation. And again, this would require a distributed sort over each feature. Finally, high cardinality of splits or lots of split candidates would lead to significant computation and communication overhead. So instead of using all unique feature values, we use approximate quantiles. And this is a standard trade-off that is done to gain improvements in performance without significant loss in accuracy. This is also cited in the uh, Planet paper. So our first implementation was a map reduce implementation where the map operation or the, the flat map in Spark terminology would take an instance of the training data as an input and would uh, output a list of split label combinations for all the splitting conditions that it satisfies. After the shuffle, during the reduce or the reduce operation or the reduce by key in Spark terminology, you take the split and the list of corresponding labels and would, and would come up with the label histograms for, the, for that split. So let's try and understand this better with an example. Say if you had one instance with horsepower 76, weight high and mileage as low, you would end up emitting six splitting conditions that you would uh, satisfy, That's, that is weight is high, which is an obvious one, horsepower less than equals to 76, less than equals to 86, and you would em also uh, emit out the, the label, which is low in this scenario. When you are reducing, you take one split at a time and the list of labels and come up with the label histogram. And the label histogram in this case for the split weight equals high is there are two low labels and no high label. And since you also know the label histograms at the parent road, it's easy to come up with the label histogram for the opposite split where weight is not high, you have two high labels and two low labels. And this is all the information that we need to calculate information gain. So in general, if we have k features, m splits per feature and n instances, the map operation emits the order of k times n times n values per best, best split computation at a node. So this leads to uh, a lot of communication overhead. So the question is, can we do better? A map operation in MapReduce is essential when the keys are not known in advance, for example, words in word count. It's not true in, in our case because we already know the split candidates in advance. So if we can somehow avoid the map, we can avoid the object creation overhead that comes along with it, and we also can avoid the communication overhead due to the shuffle state. So in order to do that, what we did was we, we uh, took our training data, which was spread over multiple par partitions over many machines, and we created par aggregated partial statistics on each of these partitions. So we start with an empty array, we go through an instance and update the split, split uh, statistic for every split candidate, and we come up with the partial statistic, and then we combine them to come up with the sufficient statistics. So what are these sufficient statistics? These are the left and the right child node statistics for each split candidate. And for classification, we only need the label counts for each label. And for regression, we need the count, the sum, and the sum of squares for variance or mean squared error calculation. The second optimization that we did was, uh, was to exploit the, the sorted order of splits. So let's take, uh, this is an example which we used to learn rule two. Here we were predicting mileage from horsepower. In order to do that, we actually put the splits on a line and then saw the contribution of each instance to each split histogram. So 
For example, we pass through the first instance, and then since the host is 95, it's belongs, it doesn't satisfy each of the three splitting conditions and goes to the right-hand side. When the horsepower is 90, it set aside the green splitting condition, that is horsepower less than equals 90, and doesn't satisfy the top two. And we do the same thing for the next two instances and come up with the, the, bin his, the uh, split histograms for each split. Now, as you have noticed, for each instance, we are actually updating the split histograms for every split candidate. And can we avoid this additional overhead? And the way to do that is to treat the, the region between the splits as bins and update those, instance, uh, tho those instead, and then calculate the split histograms from the bin histograms. So just to see this in action, you would put the first uh, instance in the bin between 90 and plus infinity, the second one between 86 and 90, the third one between minus infinity and 70, and the fourth one in the bin between 70 and 86. Now, if you observe closely, you can calculate the split histograms from the bin histograms, intermediate bin histograms that we just calculated. So for example, if you wanted to calculate the left side label histograms for the orange split, it would just be the first bin histogram, and the right side label histograms would just be the aggregate over rest of the bins. So if we have M splits per feature, you could do this binning operation using binary, binary search in log M steps versus having to perform M split comparisons. Also, when we are updating the bin histogram statistics, we just need to do it once per feature instead of M times. So it gives us significant savings in computation. The third optimization that we did was to see whether we can reduce the passes over this input data set. So the way we construct the decision tree is we first choose a split candidate at, the, at node one. When we find the best split, we take a filtered version of the original data set, which satisfies this splitting condition, and perform the same step. And we, t we apply an opposite filter to the, uh, to the data set on the right-hand side. So instead of doing this and moving these data structures in and out of memory, we could avoid doing that and just work on top of the cached input data set by applying filters on top of them. Moreover, if you notice carefully, any instance that doesn't belong to node two belongs to node three and vice versa since they're just using opposite filtering criteria. So why not train them in parallel? So what we have ended up doing is performing level-wise training of the nodes where we end up training all nodes at a particular level in, the, in a tree simultaneously. So if you have L levels in a tree, you will end up making L passes over the data instead of two raised to L minus one. And at depth four, you will end up making four passes instead of 15. These are substantial savings even for shallow trees. And if at depth 10, you'll end up making 10 passes instead of one, zero, two, three. So again, significant savings in IO. Now that we have seen the optimizations, let me talk about what features are available in the Spark MLLib library. So we have support for binary classification and regression in the Spark 1.0 release. It also supports categorical variables. We have support for arbitrary deep trees in Spark release 1.1, which will, I think will come out sometime next month. We have a pull request under review for multi-class classification problems. And also one of my favorite fe features, which is sample weights for unbalanced data sets. Now let's see some experiment, experimental results on top of uh, distributed data sets. So the first experiment we performed was on strong scaling. In strong scaling, you keep the data set size the same, and you change the number of machines that you run your experiment on to see how your Im implementation scales with the number of resources. On the x-axis on this graph, you see the number of machines. In our experiment, it was 2, 4, 8, and 16. And on the y-axis, you see the speed up compared to the baseline case. The baseline case corresponded to 20 million samples with 20 features in the data set on two workers. So if you go from two to four machines, as you can see in the ideal curve, you would expect a, improve, improve a speed up of two. 
going from two to eight, the ideal improvement would be a speed up of four. And going from two to 16, you would get a speed up of eight. And these are our experimental results. And these are not too far from ideal. Uh, I think they are within 10% of the uh, ideal curve, which is great. And the reason for the discrepancy, as expected, is due to the additional communication overhead as you start distributing computation over multiple machines. We performed several such uh, strong scaling experiments on a synthetic data set. I think it was a binary classification problem. Uh, the data set sizes range from 10 to 50 million instances, between 10 to 50 features, and from two to 16 machines. So it took anywhere between 700 megabytes to 18 gigabytes in memory. Uh, the average speed up we saw going from two to 16 machines was 6.6x, which is great since the ideal scenario is 8x. We then proceeded to perform a larger scale experiment, and this is on real Yahoo click log data. Uh, this was a regression problem with half a billion instances with 20 features and it took 90 gigabytes of distributed shared memory on, the, on a Spark cluster. On the x-axis, you see the number of machines, which range between 30 to 600. On the y-axis, you see the training time in seconds. The yellow curve corresponds to a tree of depth three, the blue one corresponds to a tree of depth five, and the purple one corresponds to a tree of depth 10. So what, is, what, 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 what did we observe from these ex this experiment? First and foremost, it works on large data sets, so that was a relief. Uh, deep trees, as expected, require more computation as compared to shallow trees. So in shallow trees, most of the computation is I.O. bound since you're just calculating label histograms. In deeper trees, there are two reasons for the uh, increase in uh, training time. First of all, you need to treat uh, train many more nodes at a level, and secondly, you also have to apply more filtering criteria for each instance. The third thing we observed was an interesting communication versus computation tra trade-off. So let's take a look at the yellow line closely. If you see the training time for 100 machines and 150 machines, they are more or less the same. So what ended up happening is, as we started adding more machines, we, the computation time kept going down, but there was an increase in communication overhead. And actually, the training time increased even more if we added more machines to the cluster. We don't observe the same phenomena in the tree of depth 10 since there's more computation to be done. But uh, we conjecture that if we keep adding more machines to this cluster, we'll see this phenomena as well. Again, these are fairly preliminary results. We are still conducting experiments to find out the right cluster sizes for various training data sizes. So let's talk briefly about ensembles. Ensembles of trees such as are, which basically use trees as building blocks are very popular in practice. So there are two families of ensembles. One is boosting, where you actually make sequential passes over the data and train a different tree, either by reweighting a sample or using a different version of the uh, data set. So for example, so this can be easily done using the trees as uh, building blocks, and we'll see this in an example uh, coming up. The random forests are also, ca can also be created by using an embarrassingly parallel implementation by taking bootstrap samples of the data set and training these trees in parallel. However, we are trying to see whether we can apply the level-wise training optimization that we did for a single tree and apply it to a multiple tree scenario. This is, uh, this would give us significant savings if we are successful with this effort. So I just wanted to see, show how easy it was to create a simple multi-class uh, classific classification Adaboost wrapper. And we won't go into the details of the code, but I just wanted to highlight two things. In every iteration, we are training a new tree over a weighted data set. And then we are re-weighting the data set samples in the data set by calculating the error in each iteration. So let's talk about the direction of our future work. Ensemble implementations are a stretch goal for 1.1. We are trying to put it in 1.1, but depends on how successful we are with our implementations. Uh, we also would love to have feature importances for all our tree algorithms. 
decision tree visualizations would be a cool feature to have. Finally, we are testing over a wide variety of user data sets. And finally, here's the request from the community. So please take a look at the MLLib decision tree documentation. It's uh, officially a part of Spark 1.0. Test drive it over your own data sets. Send us any data sets that you have. Any shape or size is fine. We would love to experiment with that. And finally, send us any feature requests or even bugs that you have to report. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. You showed sort of communication overhead penalty that you incurred as uh -huh. you scaled from two to 16 machines. As you scale it up to several hundred, did that sort of stay linear, or was there some point where it just sort of fell off? Actually, that's an experiment that we need to do. We haven't scaled it to that number of machines on that particular experiment. We, we did an experiment going up to 600 machines. However, in that case, the data set size was so huge that there was more communication that needed to be done. So uh, we'll post our results as soon as we can uh, figure out the details about that. Yeah, thanks. Sir. So the first experiment was a standalone mode, the strong scaling experiments. And the second experiment was, I think, on a yarn cluster at Yahoo. So the question is, how did we make the parallel execution at the RDD level hap ha No, it was just each partition of a shared RDD. So the, the training data set was an RDD, and those were just partitions of the RDD. And we just used the aggregate function that comes on top of a RDD to do the distributed aggregation. No, these are global contiles that are just ca calculated over the training data set at the start. We don't redo the contile computation. So, so on a few of our data sets, I have seen like that. I have experimented with the. This was uh, for a binary classification problem. I saw a fall in ROC of, I think the, around two to three percent. And again, these quantiles are configurable. So you can actually, instead of doing percentiles, you could do 1,000 quantiles. It would just take more time. So it's, we made them by default, they're percentiles, but you could increase the size of the quantiles if you want more accuracy. We, we didn't do the level-wise quantile compu uh, computation because it was creating a lot of over overhead in node-wise training. One last question, One last question please. Yes, there's a, the question is whether we have plans to add the Java API. Yes, both Java and Python support are high priority. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Yeah, can I no, there wasn't anything about that. I had done this. So you just no, it's curious. Are we up? Okay, great. Party. I, 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 oh, just real quick, I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Sandy Rizzo from Cloudera, and uh, uh, one of the uh, Hadoop and one of the Spark committers as well. Is there a clicker thing, or I can just use this? Okay, I'm not actually a Spark committer, but I appreciate it. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for coming and not spending this beautiful day outside. I'm flattered that you are at my talk, uh, not in the sun. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about end-to-end uh, -end analytics on uh, Apache Spark. Uh, some quick stuff about myself uh, before we keep going. Uh, I am on the data science team at Cloudera. Uh, before that, I was uh, our first Spark developer. Our Spark team is actually uh, about four people now. It's pretty exciting. Uh, before that, I was working on uh, Apache Hadoop, uh, working on Yarn and MapReduce. I'm on the Hadoop Project Management Committee. Uh, and I was a wee undergrad right before that. Uh, so the topic of this talk is large-scale learning. Uh, how, do we, how do we define large-scale learning? I come from sort of a systems background, so I like to think of it as uh, machine learning on so much data that you really have to use a distributed system to tackle it. Uh, what for? In the wild, what kinds of problems are actually uh, so big, have so much data that we need, uh, that we need a distributed system to tackle them? Um, so a nice thing about being uh, in data science at Cloudera is we get a sort of horizontal view of a lot of the different ways that institutions uh, use machine learning. Uh, and so maybe 80% of the use cases fall into uh, a few categories that I'm going to survey. Um, machine learning uh, is great for detecting things that, are, uh, that have been going right but are likely to go wrong soon. Probably the biggest use case here is churn prediction. Uh, this is how Sidecar knows how to send me $5 every weekend. Um, I still don't use it. Um, <clears throat> uh, detecting machine failures. Uh, institutions want to know uh, for an aircraft or for a cell phone tower or for a manufacturing facility uh, what components are most likely to fail sometime soon. Uh, and huge data is great at uh, helping to avoid uh, the kinds of catastrophes uh, that can come from this. Um, second of all, identifying bad actors. Uh, the, world is, the world is full of, of evil people, and they do all sorts of evil things. Um, and so a difficult and really important task for huge data is uh, identifying these villains and labeling them as the villains they are. Uh, the pr probably the main uh, uses here are uh, institutions want to uh, look at packets, figure out who's trying to intrude on their network. Uh, they want to figure out who's trying to commit credit card fraud. They want to uh, discover abuses of their advertising system, and they want to find faulty insurance claims. Provide recommendations. This is the third one. This is huge. Uh, any institution with tons of customers uh, needs to do this. Uh, this is how um, Amazon knows that because I bought a dress for my ex-girlfriend a couple years ago to keep showing me that same dress, um, which is a really important task for machine learning. So we, uh, we like to make a distinction between machine learning in uh, the lab and machine learning in, in the factory. Uh, in the lab, we're performing uh, predictive analytics, or sorry, not predictive analytics, uh, investigative analytics. Um, this is when we're formulating questions, we're trying to evaluate different models, uh, we're looking at all the features that are available to us and figuring out which are the ones that are actually useful uh, for training our models. Um, in the factory, we're engaged in operational analytics. Uh, we have a sort of general sense of uh, how we want to solve our problem, and we want to turn this into a, a production application. Uh, instead of uh, looking at the broad space of all possible approaches that are out there, uh, we're trying to take the particular approach that we've uh, chosen and optimize it uh, to produce results, possibly in real time, uh, for our application. So what does it mean to productionize uh, your machine learning? Uh, some models can be safely applied in batch. Uh, <clears throat> you can probably run your term predictor uh, every, uh, every day, maybe every hour at night, uh, figure out which of your customers uh, you're at risk of losing, and then take action to try to recover them. Uh, <clears throat> many use cases need real-time serving. 
especially in the case of uh, credit card fraud or faulty insurance claims, uh, you have bad actors that are trying to do something and you want to immediately be able to classify them as such uh, so you can prevent them from doing what they're trying to do. Uh, recommendations also fall into this category. Uh, someone shows up at your, uh, your homepage uh, and you want to immediately be able to tell them what kind of products uh, they should be looking at. Um, in addition to real-time serving, a bunch of use cases also need real-time updates. Uh, especially recommendations, uh, whenever somebody uh, clicks on something on your website, that's immediately a piece of signal that you can use to uh, build a better profile of that person. And being able to uh, recommend movies based on immediate clicks uh, is really useful uh, uh, case for real-time updates in machine learning. Um, so this is, where, this is where infrastructure comes in. Uh, for our purposes, infrastructure is going to be uh, services that are trying to do something reliable. Um, so I think there are sort of three different kinds of infrastructure for the three different problems that we're trying to solve uh, in productionizing machine learning. Uh, first of all, there's model building. Uh, we need an infrastructure that can reliably uh, build models on a schedule of time. Whether we want to rebuild our model on the entire data every hour, every day, um, we need something that can do that without fail. Uh, this is maybe the easiest. Uh, Apache Uzi is a pretty, uh, is a pretty good <clears throat> tool for doing this kind of stuff. Uh, second of all, model serving. We need infrastructure that can sit uh, behind our application uh, and whenever uh, <clears throat> a credit card tra transaction comes in or a insurance claim, uh, we can pass it uh, to our model serving infrastructure and have it immediately uh, make a decision about that. Um, and last of all, model updating infrastructure. Infrastructure that uh, <clears throat> uh, doesn't view our model as a static thing, but as real-time updates come in, can uh, modify it <clears throat> Uh, in order to provide better uh, recommendations or classifications. Um, so Oryx is a project that, uh, open source project we've been working at Cloudera that tries to satisfy some of these needs. Uh, sort of the, the central thesis of Oryx is that it makes sense to include model building, model serving, model updating into a single, uh, into a single system. Uh, and doing that has a few, uh, has a few different advantages. Um, first of all, Data scientists and people building uh, <coughs> websites or production applications tend to be uh, in two different parts of an organization. So uh, allowing, uh, having two different uh, projects, allowing you to asynchronously update models um, independent from application development is really important. Uh, second of all, machine learning often requires uh, sets of uh, pre-processing steps, you want to normalize your data, you might want to uh, project it into some space, figure out which clusters it's closest to. Uh, a single system allows you to have a consistent view uh, of the transformations that you need to make both on your uh, model building and model serving side. Uh, and third of all, more advanced, uh, this isn't something we've implemented yet, uh, but experiments are really important. Uh, you have a few different models you want to try out, you want to tweak, tweak certain parameters, um, served differently to people uh, in, in different parts of the world. Having machine learning infrastructure uh, allows you uh, to run these experiments and try to uh, figure out uh, what model really is best for, uh, for your use case. So <clears throat> this is the state of, uh, of Oryx 1.0. Uh, Oryx 1.0 relies on uh, custom-built uh, algorithms uh, in MapReduce. Uh, and it uses those for its, uh, its batch model building when you are uh, building a model on the entire data. Uh, and then for model update, for a real-time update, when a click comes in and you want to be able to provide recommendations immediately based on that click, uh, we simply uh, have our model servers uh, partitioned by user. Uh, so uh, when I click, all my stuff goes to a particular, uh, particular server. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, whenever you want to uh, score a product from me, you send me to that server. So that server knows about me, but the other ones don't. Uh, here's sort of the uh, Oryx 1.0 architecture diagram. Uh, so having our own implementations of these MapReduce algorithms is super nice and all, but it's kind of a waste of everybody's time. It's a waste of our time uh, that we're implementing these when scalable, nice implementations uh, exist uh, outside of Oryx. Uh, and it's also a waste of our users' time that they're using a framework like MapReduce, which really isn't good for uh, the variety of iterative computations uh, that are used uh, in various machine learning algorithms. And so this, of course, is what brings us to uh, Spark and MLib. For those of you who aren't familiar, MLib is a sub-project of Spark that concerns itself with uh, having a bunch of high-quality implementations 
of common machine learning algorithms. Uh, this is sort of the uh, st state of the art in MLlib right now. Um, I like to you know, divide up machine learning along these two axes, uh, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, uh, discrete and continuous. Uh, it's got something for everybody. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff coming soon. Um, so the idea is that MLlib uh, currently does, or, or very soon uh, will, encompass everything that is in Oryx. Um, we're going to have higher quality implementations, more implementations, um, and they're going to be built on Spark, uh, which is really better for solving these kinds of problems than MapReduce. So the central idea of Oryx 2.0 is that we're going to replace the MapReduce algorithms with MLlib. Uh, and replace the real-time update as well with Spark streaming. Um, this brings us to Lambda architecture. It's kind of a, it's kind of a buzzwordy term, uh, <clears throat> but also I think it's uh, really, really valuable. The idea basically is that we, uh, we maintain two views on our data. Uh, we have uh, our batch data, or, sorry, our, our entire data, and we're able to periodically uh, retrain our entire models or you know, outside of a mach machine learning contest, uh, context, uh, do aggregations. Uh, on the entirety of our data once every hour, once every day. Um, and then on top of this batch layer, we have a speed layer that's concerned with dealing with data as it comes in, uh, in real time, uh, and allowing us uh, to have a, like an up-to-date view of our data. Uh, so <clears throat> in Oryx 2.0, the batch layer is handled by Spark, and the, uh, and the speed layer is handled by Spark Streaming. So here's the, the, the colorful, beautiful, uh, architecture, tentative architecture diagram of uh, Oryx 2.0. Um, at the center is this model building component. And the model builder is doing two things. It's every hour, every day, however long you want to configure it uh, to. Uh, it's uh, rebuilding the model on the entire data. Um, simultaneously, it's handling updates through Spark Streaming. So we assume that you can have a huge amount of updates. People are clicking on stuff on your website all the time. Um, you're getting measurements from uh, sensors on your machines all the time, uh, and that all goes through Kafka and into, uh, into Spark Streaming. Spark Streaming concerns itself with uh, processing these and uh, distilling from that firehose information what updates we need to make to the model. Uh, so both, uh, both the batch component are rebuilding the model from scratch, uh, and Spark Streaming uh, and, and functions there uh, concern themselves with uh, incremental updates to that model. Uh, finally, uh, when we have these changes to the model, uh, we push them out through Kafka, uh, and these go to all the model servers, uh, which can be scaled uh, independently of the demons that are actually in charge of uh, <coughs> handling updates uh, and training our models. So <coughs> this is the last thing I'm going I'm to leave you with. Um, the last uh, few takeaways that I want are, first of all, there's a difference between uh, building libraries of machine learning algorithms and actually uh, getting those into a state and building up uh, all the stuff around them that allows you to include those in our production application. Uh, but also that the distinction between these two is pretty blurry. Uh, and these are a couple, these are a few different things uh, that we're thinking about putting in Oryx or have put in Oryx already, but it might actually make more sense uh, to put in uh, MLlib as well. Uh, so. Uh, the first is PMML output. PMML is this uh, sort of a, maybe ancient is, uh, is a little too far back, but it's, it's a, a venerable standard uh, <clears throat> for expressing uh, machine learning algorithms. And the advantage of uh, being able to output into a standard like PMML is that a variety of different frameworks can consume a model uh, and serve it independent of who's actually building the model. Uh, second of all, model update. In some cases, especially when we're using uh, online learning algorithms or streaming, uh, streaming algorithms, it's very simple. You use the same code for, uh, for updating your model as new data comes in as you would for training in batch in the first place. Uh, but in other cases, uh, it's not so straightforward. And having, uh, paying uh, specific attention to how after a model is already built, you can update it in real time, I think would be a really nice thing to go into MLlib. Uh, Last of all, all the stuff uh, that comes around, not just with building models, uh, but with the entire, uh, the entire data science workflow around uh, tuning, uh, constructing, putting together a machine learning algorithm. Uh, Cross-validation, hyperparameter tuning, splitting into train and test sets. Uh, this is stuff that I think uh, uh, MLlib is already thinking about a lot, um, as well as people at Berkeley. 
Uh, and I think that uh, just calling it out as an area of focus is really important. It's more important, let's say, than adding fancy new algorithms in certain cases. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I've got for you. Uh, if you want to contribute, github.com slash cloudera slash oryx. Um, and any questions? So uh, the question was, what's the, uh, the long-term vision of Oryx? Uh, will Oryx and MLlib become so similar? What's the real value of Oryx? Um, so the things that I put in the last slide are things that uh, could uh, well go into MLlib. Uh, in terms of actual infrastructure for uh, <clears throat> model serving and model update, I think that's unlikely to go into MLlib. If MLlib took that direction, I think maybe we would just decide to s scrap Oryx and say, let's throw everything here. Um, but MLlib is more concerned with providing um, uh, statistics, providing machine learning algorithms, whereas Oryx is more concerned with, uh, okay, now that you have those, how do you build a production application out of those? How do you have, um, how do you create services uh, that are gonna sit there, update your model, and, uh, and serve it? Um, the question was, is there a, a component in Oryx for testing your models so you can uh, validate a model that's not going to do worse uh, before you push it out? Uh, no, but I think that would be a good thing to add. Sweet. Thanks a lot. <laughs>